Your dad said from a young age you had no fear in your heart. Fear or love or joy or misery, we make it up because I never got educated. So I just stayed the way crea Creator intended you to be. Can you tell us a bit about Samadhi? Samadhi means you have given up your hallucinations. Have you ever felt the emotion of sadness, Sadhguru? I am capable of every emotion. Lot of young people are refusing to go to heaven because they said there's no Wi-Fi there. Everybody in Australia must say yes to safe soil. I will make that my mission, Sadhguru. Sadhguru, what's the most mystical experience that you have ever had? Namaskaram, Sarah. Hello, how are you? How are you down under? <laughs> I am good. Welcome, Sadhguru, whose name means a guru within. Your dad said from a young age you had no fear in your heart. How was that so? Well, uh, <laughs> either uh, fear or love or joy or misery, is not anywhere in our hearts or minds. We make it up. We have the manufacturing units of we can either manufacture joy or misery, fear or uh, love, whatever we want we can manufacture. People think these things are instilled in us. They are not instilled in us, we make them. So if you take charge of your faculties, if your mind, if your heart listens to you, then definitely you will produce the most pleasant and wonderful aspects of what you can do. If uh, they are happening unconsciously and compulsively in reaction to something else around us, then of course it will ref reflect whatever else is happening around us. So the question is, is it consciousness or compulsiveness? Is it human being responding to life or reacting to life? This is a choice that every be human being has and I don't see uh, that today our education systems, our societies have done nothing to bring up our children, to train our children to use their f faculties right. We are training our children to use the entire universe. Every creature we want to use for our benefit, but how to use our own faculties to the best impact upon ourselves and everybody else around us is unfortunately completely missing in the education. And because I never got educated, so I just stayed the way crea Creator intended you to be <laughs> How was your childhood, Sadhguru? Huh? How was your childhood? Oh, terrible for my fair parents, wonderful for me <laughs> 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 Even though there was no rainforest next to my house, I found a little forest and got lost for days on end. And uh, I really, now when I look back and see, I really sympathize and empathize with my parents. Uh, I thought uh, I'm having a wonderful adventure, but they must have been losing it, you know <laughs> Didn't you used to catch snakes as a child? Uh, they came to me, so I took them <laughs> Can you tell us a bit about Samadhi? And you have such an extraordinary uh, story about this, where the period where you reach Samadhi, which for people that don't know, the meaning of that is the mind is in a state of total balance. And I've heard you say that during this period, even your appearance started to change. See, uh, it's like this. Right now, uh, which which city are you in, sir? In Melbourne. Melbourne. Oh, uh, Melbourne is the city that I visited maximum number of times in Australia. <laughs> so, uh, mm, see, when it comes to your body, without the umbilical cord of breath and bread, this cannot exist for a moment, isn't it? So. You as a person, physically, is actually not really a person because without breaching the boundaries of this body, you cannot exist. Without food going into you, without air going in and out, there is no existence for you. So individuality is only 
on the level of your mind. It's a psychological construct that you think you're an individual. And uh, because it's nature's magnanimity, though we are just a speck in this cosmos, it has given us an individual experience. I think human beings are taking this individual experience too seriously and assuming individualism. There is no individualism, you cannot exist here in this atmosphere without being connected to the soil out of which you're eating food and to the air out of which you're uh, breathing. Without this, you cannot exist. The connection is much bigger, like much, much bigger because over sixty percent of your physical body is actually microorganisms. With one, of course, you're fighting right now <laughs> The rest of them are working for us. Even this guy, we have to train him to work for us, but instead of that, we are battling because we think we are too smart. But sixty percent of it is largely microorganisms, only forty percent is genetic material from your parentage. So when this is the case, physically there is no such thing as individual, you are one with everything. Only psychologically, you become a total individual. How much of a strong boundary you draw around yourself, that much you feel suffocated, that much you feel imprisoned within yourself. So this is a human predicament. There is the magnanimity and uh, of nature that has given us individual experience. There's a privilege that though we are a speck in this cosmos, we can sit here and wonder about the nature of the cosmos itself. If <laughs> you look at the size of who we are in this cosmos, we are not even a speck of dust, but we can wonder about the cosmos. This is a tremendous privilege, but we are abusing this by thinking this is an absolute. This is not an absolute, it is only in the construct of your psychological sphere that you are an individual. Most people understand this only when you bury them, then they understand they are part of the world. When they're living, when they're prancing around on this planet, <laughs> they think they are alive by themselves. So, this psychological phenomena of thinking that I am an absolute individual, this sense of absolutism has come in many ways. Uh, one thing is, uh, you know, this… Uh, b this fight for survival makes us strengthen and shore up our boundaries more and more. Then there are religious teachings which are tell you, telling you this is an absolute thing, this is made in the image of God and whatever else. But there is no absolutism to life. Life is not absolute. It is an ongoing process. And in this process, right now you and me are floating on top of the process. One day we will be again to the bottom of the process. One day we will be again into the recycling of the process. Today we are floating on the top of the process and now we get fanciful ideas in our heads. So what samadhi means is, to make your uh, intellect equanimous. Why you have to make your intellect equanimous is, because the basic function of the intellect is to discriminate. You are able to discriminate between one thing and the other only because your intellect is functioning. This is me, this is the chair upon which I am sitting, this is me, that is you. All these distinctions have come only because intellect is functioning. When you fall asleep, you are not an individual anymore, isn't it? You're just life. Even now you are just life. So if you can be awake, if you can be fully awake and still shed the discriminatory process of your mind and experience life in its totality the way it is as a process, as a tremendous phenomena that's happening to us, not an absolute that we have conquered, then you are in a state of samadhi. Samadhi means you have given up your hallucinations and you have come to the experiencing the reality the way it is, the nature of the reality is, we are a part of a, a large phenomena, we are not an absolute happening. Mm. With the noise of the world as it is, Sadhguru, how do we do this to really achieve that oneness when we… They are selling earbuds in the pharmacies, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this is like this. What you see, what you hear, what you smell, what you taste, what you touch, all of it has a certain texture, all of it has a certain quality. But it becomes significant only if I react to it. If I don't react to something, 
it almost like it has nothing to do, it's like this. See, suppose you are… Uh, Melbourne airport is not so crowded, but anyway, let's say you're driving to the airport and there's a massive traffic jam, you're getting late. Now you suffer the traffic jam so much, you're there and you can't believe it's stuck like this, all this, but somehow you got there, you can't run anymore in the airport, but suppose you ran into the airplane, got into it somehow and then it flew. When it takes off, then you look down, still the traffic jam is on on the road, but it looks so beautiful, a string of white lights and red lights, really wonderful actually. Because why? Because there's a distance, this is all it is. What's happening in your mind? This physiological process and the psychological process and the social process that's happening around you, you can be involved but not entangled. If only, if you have a little distance, my whole work is about this, my work is not a teaching, not a philosophy, not an ideology, it is not a from a scripture. These are simply technologies to give you tools where if you sit here, your body is here, your psychological space is working somewhere else, what is you is little away from this. Once you have a little distance between you and your body, physical suffering is over. Once there is a little distance between you and your psychological process, mental suffering is over. These are the only two forms of suffering human beings have, physical and mental. If you maintain a little distance, you can enjoy everything, you can be involved in everything, but never entangled in everything. How do you do that, Sadhguru, with your emotions? So say, you know, if someone was to pass away and you love them so much and that they were part of your family or something like that, or, you know, you fell in love with a person and they left you, how do you not get yourself entangled in that? How do you keep your distance? See, uh, what I say right now may sound very cruel, so don't react to this, but spend some time on it, you will realize what I'm saying. Yeah. <clears throat> See, whoever we love, how much ever we think we love them, or how much ever they… we think they love us, one way or the other, we will lose them one day. Either they die, we die, they divorce, you divorce, you go away, they go away, something will happen, isn't it? Inevitably so or no? Absolutely. Inevitably so. So, we are misunderstanding a co-passenger of life as a destination, that is the biggest problem. We are thinking we meet somebody, someone that we love, a spouse or a child or a parent is not a destination, they are just our co-passengers. So if you travel with people, uh, you can't say this on an airplane because everybody gets off at one place. Suppose you're traveling by a train, well, you're real friends for the few hours, you're together and somebody gets off. When they get off, yes, you miss them. Especially during the journey, if they greatly enhanced and enriched your life, should you cherish them or should you grieve them, I'm asking. Mm, that's a nice way of looking cherish, of course. So instead of cherishing them, we are grieving them simply because we have… we have been using them as a crutch. We have been using them as uh, a source of happiness in our lives. So this is why it's very important to understand human experience is caused from within. Whether it is love or misery, joy or misery, love or hate, whatever or whatever, Everything is caused from within us, human experience comes from within us. The seat of your experience is within you, but you are using someone or something as a means to stimulate that experience. See, what you call as love, you may right now call it as an emotion, it's a certain experience. Joy is a certain experience, misery is a certain experience, fear is a certain experience. All experiences are generated within us. Now the problem is, we think it is happening from outside. Someone may stimulate this. So you may use something or someone to activate that emotion within you. But I'm saying, suppose uh, I can make you laugh. You can also laugh by yourself, isn't it? It's Hello? True. Yes. So now, oh, Sadhguru is not here, so I cannot laugh anymore. That is a crippled life. 
that is a crippled life. So the similarly, somebody loved you, well, that person is not here. Well, love did not happen from that person to you. That person, you use that person to, you know, bring out the love within you. So, whether you want this to be, you know, like there used to be cars in forties and fifties, uh, where if you buy the car along with that, you need two, uh, two people to help you in the morning, because it's a push start. Yes, yes. Then it evolved into a crank start, one person could do it. Now all our autom automobiles are self-start, isn't it? So I am talking about upgrading of technologies. You must be on self-start, all that is very vital to your life, your joyfulness, your peacefulness, your love, everything that is pleasant and vital and wonderful for you must be on self-start. This is what inner engineering means. You engineer yourself in such a way, you being peaceful, joyful, loving, blissful is not in somebody else's hands, it's in your hands. Now, this does not mean you don't have human relationships, this does not mean you do not value people, but this means you make relationships to share your joy, not to squeeze joy out of somebody. That's beautiful. Have you ever felt the emotion of sadness, Sadhguru? It was just coming up, I drank it down, so it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> See, uh, am I capable of being sad? I am not a cripple, I am capable of every emotion. It's just that I have made sure that what happens within me is determined by me. If you were determining what should happen within you, would you choose sadness or blissfulness within you? You tell me what's your choice. Blissfulness. That's been my choice too. <laughs> so profound. Most people in life, Sadhguru, want freedom, but you say freedom also has certain bondages. Why is that? See, people are only talking about freedom, but all the time they are only trying to bond themselves to somebody. Your previous question just means this. See, I bonded so well with somebody and that somebody is gone for whatever reason. Either death has taken or life situations has taken, something will take them, all right? Now, you were enjoying your bondage, when bonds age, they become bondage, okay? <laughs> uh, that is a silly wordplay, but <laughs> but bondages are developed with constant contact. So, you're enjoying the bondage. When you get freedom, you suffer. So, freedom is only a word being spoken about, but not really being sought because people are terrified of freedom. Freedom means there is no definition to your life. If your life is defined, if your persona is defined, if you as a human being is defined, this is what you are, that means you are within the confines of something, isn't it? Yes. So if there is no definition to your life, if you can simply exist here, it would be fantastic. How many people are willing to do that? How many people are capable of doing it right now? So people talk about freedom, their idea of freedom is that they should do whatever they compulsively want to do. Yeah. So somebody wants to smoke, he thinks it's freedom to smoke. It's not freedom, you can't do without it, that's not called freedom. I can be any way I want, now I choose to be this way, this is freedom. I can only be this way, this is not freedom. So you are painting bondage as freedom, if you really look at freedom, most human beings are terrified of freedom because an undefined life, they're afraid of it. They want a definition to their life. All the time, they're trying to define. It is this need within the human being which has formed nations, which have formed differences of races, religions, caste, creed, genders. Why are we always defining something? Because we want to be encased in something, mm. to be simply free without any definition. Oh, it's too scary for most people, because if you want to be free, first and foremost thing is your experience of who you are right now. What happens within you right now must be determined by you, only then you would dare to be free. If external situations 
can cause experiences within you, you don't want to be free, you want to be protected. You can call it a home, you can call it a love affair, you can call it a society, you can call it a nation, but we are always trying to define boundaries, isn't it? Yes. No, absolutely. People say that knowledge gives us power, and you are ob obviously an unbelievably knowledgeable person, but you say... <laughs> <No. he> <laughs> very knowledgeable. <laughs> But you say, keep your mind razor sharp and uncluttered. Can you talk to us about that? See, in the yogic uh, culture, we always identify with our ignorance, not with our knowledge. Because the way the creation is, nobody knows where it begins, where it ends. Nobody knows the shape, size and definition of what this creation is. Only somebody who is very conceited and uh, given themselves or subscribe themselves to some dogmatic beliefs, look like they know everything, there is heaven, earth and God and this and that and everything, definitions about everything. Otherwise, if you really with an open mind, you look at it, you don't know a damn thing, all right? You don't know a damn thing about life. In the middle of nowhere, this little mud ball called earth is floating around, in that you're a tiny speck, and you think too much about yourself. So how much ever you can know, even if you've digested all the libraries on the planet, still uh, what you know is a minuscule in this cosmos. So if you identify with this minuscule, you will become a minuscule. If you look at what you do not know, if you look at your knowledge, it's a minuscule always, whoever you are. If you look at your ignorance, it's boundless. So we always identify with our ignorance, what we do not know. Because what we do not know is a limitless process. And if you identify with what you do not know, your intelligence shall never sleep. Even if your body sleeps, your intelligence will not sleep. But the moment you think, I know, you immediately your intelligence goes to sleep. Are you always still learning, Sadhguru? I'm sorry? Are you always still learning? Learn nothing, I just remain just the way I was born <laughs> Learn nothing <laughs> But you seem to have so much knowledge on so many different topics that is so profound. Where does it come from? See, have I spoken any knowledge as such? I'm just talking about life because I am life, I am life. Other people are... Mostly they have become a bundle of thoughts, emotions, ideas, prejudices, philosophies and belief systems. I am none of those things, I am just life. When I am life, everything that is life, you should know, isn't it? So people are asking me wherever I am going these days because we have this, uh, you know, this safe soil conscious planet movement. Uh, I am talking so much about ecology, people are saying, how do you know all this? I said, I am a worm. I've lived on this planet for over six and a half decades, all right? They said, we also lived on this planet. I said, no, no, you don't live on this planet, you live in your head because you got a lot of stuff there. My head is empty, so I live on this planet. Like a worm knows everything that he needs to know for his life, I know everything that I need to know for my life and the nature of human intelligence is such, once you see something, once you experience something, once you feel something, you are capable of expanding it to every other aspect. That's true, that's very true. People, true? people are in the hand, you know, still in the mode of, you know, the old uh, caveman, or I'm sorry, you can't say man anymore, cave persons. Yes. Hello, I'm sorry <laughs> The cave people were hunters and gatherers. Even today, most… even today in twenty-first century, most people are just hunters and gatherers. Maybe they're not hunting for uh, flesh and uh, collecting bones and beads and something, they're collecting PhDs and MSCs and this one and that one. Today what you call as knowledge is just gathering information. Still hunters and gatherers, instead of going into the jungles, they're going into the universities. But I'm preparing people to live in the universe, not in the university, because life happens in the universe. 
all of us exist in the universe. We have false ideas of where we are. We are here in this massive creation, just a tiny little speck, but still such a level of perception that we can even look and even wonder about it, even if we don't know, at least we can wonder about it, which is not a small thing. On this planet, only a human being has this privilege and that should not go waste. That's what the whole work is about, so that that does not go waste in one's life. Yes. Sadhguru, how do we create our destiny consciously and how much control do we have over our lives? See, the quality of your life is not determined by the type of house you're living in, the type of car you're driving, the sort of clothes that you wear, the sort of food that you eat, no. The quality of your life is essentially determined how you're experiencing life right now. Yes or no? Yes. Suppose, suppose you were in Australia ten thousand years ago, uh, you would look very different. <laughs> I think yes, yesterday or day before was the hundred and fiftieth anniversary of uh, first shipload of people going from England, was it so? Yes, I, I think so, that's correct. Yeah, I think I saw it on the news. Anyway, if you were there ten thousand years ago, you would be very different. You would be living somewhere in the open, under a tree or on a rock or whatever. Does it mean to say you would be miserable? No. No. Probably you were having a grand life, as long as you're well nourished. Maybe you had a grand life uh, crawling under a rock and living there. No home, no this kind of clothing, no this kind of fancy food, no all this uh, social media, no talking to Sadhguru across the continents, nothing. But you were doing great. So only now your misery comes from comparing yourself how everybody else is. But on that day, if you had a little better rock than the other person, you were fine, isn't it? Yeah. So I'm saying human human life or the quality of human life is not determined by what we have. What we have is a consequence of the times in which we exist. What we have is not the determin determining factor for who we are and how we experience this life. How you experience your life, you can determine one hundred percent. What is around you is not yours because it's a consequence of time, isn't it? Where you are today in twenty-first century is not your making. It has happened because of whole society or the world or humanity moving in a certain direction. So, what you have is a consequence of the times in which you exist. How you experience is one hundred percent yours. When you say destiny, people are thinking, if I go to moon, oh, that was my destiny. No, even you can go to moon and be miserable. Hello? They, they didn't look very joyful, the guys who landed there <laughs> <laughs> I, With all due respect to them, they did something fantastic, but still, I am saying people who are living in palaces are not looking blissed out. Yeah. People who, who have earned billions of dollars, they are not looking blissed out. So what I am saying is, your destiny is to determine the quality of your life. That is one hundred percent in your hands. This is what the whole movement, inner engineering movement is all about, that you determine the quality of your life by determining the quality of your experience. Once the quality of your experience is set, wherever you are, you will do your best and you're fine. If you were here ten thousand years ago, you would be in the same level of experience. Today, with all the facility, you will be in the same level of experience. So, do you think anything in life then is fated? I'm sorry? Do you think anything in life then is fated? Well, you've been traveling to India, I think. Yeah, I actually have. <laughs> I love India. <laughs> you should come, Sarah, sometime. You must come to South India. I will. <laughs> We are in a very beautiful place. Oh, where I'm staring at you and it just feels magical. So if I can feel that over Zoom, I can only imagine what it's like to be there. <laughs> so, uh, is there something called fate? Is there something that is predetermined? That's your yeah. question. Yes, yes. There's one thing that is predetermined that everything that's born will die. But 
How you experience life is entirely in your hands, nobody can determine that, especially nobody can predetermine that. It is very much possible that no matter where you are born, in what kind of conditions you are born, you can still make your life beautiful by experiencing it in a beautiful way. When I say beautiful, right now in twenty-first century people may have this, uh, if my life has to be beautiful, my home should be like this, my car should be like this, I must have free Wi-Fi, you know. <laughs> lot of, That's important. Lot of, yeah, <laughs> lot of young people are refusing to go to heaven because they said there's no Wi-Fi there. <laughs> so, uh, these things are consequential situations. These things don't dis determine your experience. If you allow them to determine your experience, that means you have become a slave of the situations in which you exist. That means somewhere in the evolutionary process of becoming human, you have gone backwards because all other creatures are made like this. Their life is determined by the situations in which they exist. Our life is made by the way we conduct ourselves, not necessarily by the situations in which we exist. I think that hundred and fifty years ago, that first shipload of people, when they were dropped off on uh, this island called Australia today, I'm sure they must have felt so miserable, they've been dropped off in such a faraway island and this is the end of their life. But today you're very happy being in Australia, it's just the times, isn't it? Yeah. Or maybe there were some adventurous people in that ship who thought, this is great, at least no loss, no problems, I can live the way I want <laughs> We don't know, we don't know what they did, I'm just using that as an example. Uh, with all due respect to all the Australian people, I... I very much uh, enjoyed your country during my travels. I drove across uh, Australia and uh, I've spent some time there and it's been wonderful. So, what I'm saying is, we are misunderstanding external circumstances and inner possibilities. External circumstances, we want them pleasant, it is true. That will take some effort, that will take some cooperation from everybody around us because there are many forces involved. But to make our body pleasant, mind pleasant, emotions pleasant and our energies pleasant, this is entirely, one hundred percent our business. But we are expecting somebody else to make our mind and emotion pleasant. Well, slavery has begun. No way. If somebody can decide what should happen within you, you're deeply, deeply enslaved, isn't it? Worst kind of slavery. That's so interesting, Sadhguru. Now, you obviously do so many wonderful things and at the moment, as you know, as most of us know, our planet is an unbelievably beautiful and precious and if we don't take care of it, humankind will cease to exist. So you started this global movement called Conscious Planet. Can you tell us a little bit about that? See, there are a lot of uh, talk about ecology, environment, global warming, climate change. All these are issues, I'm not saying no. I was just talking to somebody, a uh, very prominent person in India, who has been involved in various ecological movements, and I've been talking to various environment ministers of various nations. Even in COP26, it seems one week, this uh, minister was there, and uh, she said, I, I did not hear the word soil for this whole week in COP26 in Glasgow. Why is it that you don't hear the word soil when you're talking about environment? Because largely these things are crafted by urban people. They're only talking about urban problems of pure air and clean water is their problem in cities. They're only talking about that. But the real problem is soil, because soil degradation is happening at a pace that if we don't check it now, uh, it will be out of control. To tell you the simple fact of this is, every responsible scientist in the world is clearly pointing out, by 2045, we will be producing forty percent less food than what we are producing right now, and our populations will be 9.3 billion people. Not a place you want to live, isn't it? No, not at all. Not a place to leave our children in, definitely, because 
thousand years of civilization will be destroyed in three days of food shortages. Yes, human beings will turn into beasts once again. If there is severe food shortages, everything will be gone. So, how is it that we are ignoring this? When nearly forty percent of climate change is because of open soils that we have created, unprotected soils. So, simple things that are need to be done in the form of agriculture, which was always being done. For example, I've lived on farms in India. This was part of the practice fifty years ago. Every farm during summer, they would cover it with legume crops or pulses, alternately one year legumes, one year pulses, knowing fully well we won't get any yield out of it. We'll get very little yield, it's not worthwhile. But this was kept as summer cover, this is a cover crop. And uh, when the time comes, they were plowing back this whole crop back into the soil, very easily giving two to three inches of humus. The word humus means living soil. First thing is, humanity has forgotten, soil is a living entity. Who we are right now, even in the evolutionary process, who we are right now is a consequence of what is happening in the soil. Trillions of life forms, one handful of soil has over seven to eight billion life forms in it, or fifty to seven… fifty thousand to seventy-five thousand species of life forms in one handful of soil. That is the kind of magic that is happening. It's that magic which turns into a mango, it is that magic becomes rice or wheat, it's that mangi magic be because you're a Australian woman, I'm saying becomes an avocado. <laughs> See, I got you, good I got man, you. Good man, good <laughs> man. I got you <laughs> Very important. <laughs> so, it is that soil magic which is making all these things, and it's that magic that's made you and me. Yeah. So, what do we do, Sadhguru? How do so, we stop this? So, the simple thing is this. First thing to understand is, soil is not our property. It's a legacy that we have received from previous generations. The last or the previous generation could destroy… could have destroyed the whole soil and given us a barren desert. No, they gave us living soil. It's our business to pass it on that way to the next generation. What I'm asking through the Save Soil movement is, the minimum is, minimum three to six percent organic content should be there in the soil if you have to keep the soil alive. First twelve to fifteen inches of soil is the source of eighty-seven percent of life forms on this planet, including all of us. This fifteen inches of soil is being destroyed because today we are plowing with machines where twelve to fifteen inches deep it's plowing and we're leaving it open to the sun, we're just destroying all life. The life that makes us, the life that sustains us, not only with food, our very body over sixty percent is the same life. Our body is just a reflection of the soil upon which we stand. But now we have… we don't seem to realize this. The choice is just this, either we get this now when we are alive or one day we will get it from the maggots when it's too late. So, on an average, the loss of species of microbes that's happening per year in the world is on an average, about twenty-seven thousand species are being lost per year. So, it's estimated if you leave it like this for another thirty to forty years, it will take hundred and fifty to two hundred years to turn it around. But we… if we act now, in the next fifteen to twenty-five years, we can turn it around significantly. This is why this generation, all of us here, this is a generational responsibility. We must make it happen. Everybody talks about personal action. I'm discouraging them from personal action. I'm not saying you should not do. But the most important thing is to establish a global policy because suppose you have a thousand acres of land and you kept it very nicely alive and wonderful, but the next generation may come and rip it apart. Yeah. This is why we want it enshrined in the policy of every nation. One hundred and ninety-two democratically elected governments are there. We want in all those countries that it must be established in the policy. Keeping the soil alive is a fundamental responsibility. If you want to live on the land, you must keep it alive. 
it should become the norm. Like if you want to build a house in the city, you must allow some space for your neighbor, for something else to happen around you. Similarly, if you live on agricultural lands, if you own agricultural lands, you must keep it alive. The most disgraceful thing is, see, wherever human beings are not there, it's all going well. So it looks like human being is the only problem. When we talk about agricultural lands, agriculture means this is one piece of land which is nearly sixty-seven percent of the world's land, which is being daily tended to by human beings. What we are tending to must be in the best condition. Unfortunately, what we are tending to is in the worst possible condition. This has to be reversed. So, Guru, what can volunteers around the world and especially in the Asia-Pacific Asia region do to contribute to this wonderful project? See, from March 21st, uh, <laughs> as you must already know, uh, it's a lone motorcycle. <clears throat> I'm sixty-five years of age. I'm riding thirty thousand kilometers through twenty-four nations, meeting the heads of state and other leaders in the countries to make this policy change. Fortunately, in Europe, already the change has begun to happen in the direction. So, where the governments have already taken the steps, we want the people to support the government because no matter what kind of government you have, always the resources are scarce. If you do one thing, something else has to be missed out. But when government… Uh, the span or the terms of the government are only five years or six years at the most, naturally they will focus on things which will produce results in five years. Nobody wants to invest on something which will take fifteen to twenty years to produce result because it is beyond their, uh, you know, uh, their time or their term. So it's very important that people stand up. There are 5.26 billion people on the planet who have franchise, that means they have voting powers, they can select a or elect a government. So we want at least 3 to 3.5 billion people, which is around 60 percent of the electorate on the planet, to give confidence to their governments that we are with you. If you invest long term, we are with you. We don't want short-term trinkets, we want a long-term well-being of our lives and our children's lives and the future of this planet itself. So this statement has to be made. So the purpose of this rally is to get this statement. You must make sure, Sarah, that everybody in Australia must say yes to save soil. Absolutely. I will make that my mission, Sadhguru. It's your planet too. <laughs> it is. It is my planet and I want it to be beautiful for everyone that comes after me as well. Sadhguru, what do you believe is the purpose of the human experience? Human experience or existence? Existence. Hey, you change just like that. <laughs> <laughs> so you are essentially asking why life? Yes. Why? Has it been so bad? No, it's been great. <laughs> but I do think to myself sometimes, I wonder from your perspective why you think that we are, we are here. You know those uh, famous uh, 70s, uh, 60s, I think it's in 60s song, sometimes I feel like a motherless child. That's what you're asking, sometimes. When you are feeling absolutely wonderful, you are blissed out right now, do you think why life? No. No. Only in some way it becomes a little burdensome. Then you think, why all this life, you know? Philosophies will come out. So, when it comes to life, you should never ask why, you should ask how. If you ask how, I will give you a method, how to make it absolutely fantastic. If you ask why, I will have to tell you a story. <laughs> how, Sadhguru, how? How means, see, how have human beings trying to… try to handle this? What is human problem? Let's look at it this way. See, in the evolutionary scale of things, between a chimpanzee and you, the DNA difference is only 1.23 percent. 1.23 percent is not much of a difference, isn't it? <laughs> no. Physiologically, that's how close we are to a chimpanzee. But in terms of our intelligence and awareness, we are worlds apart. This is the human struggle. 
that you have an intelligence for which you don't have a stable enough platform. Now your own intelligence is bothering you. If you had the brain of an earthworm, oh, you would be ecologically friendly, you wouldn't need any teaching, <laughs> isn't it? Now the problem is, intelligence has become a problem. You tell me, Sarah, should intelligence be a source of problem or a source of solution? It should be a source of solution. It must be, that's the only solution actually. Yeah. Ultimately, intelligence is the only solution. But we have made it a source of problem because there is no stability in our existence. Because still, in the evolutionary scheme of things, we are new. Our bodies are still not able to support our chemistry, our energy system is not able to support the intelligence that's invested in us. So, you're supposed to do something to stabilize this. If you stabilize this, this intelligence is the greatest thing that's ever happened. Yes, the most fantastic thing about being human is our intelligence. We are not as strong as a... Uh, not even a umbert. But that guys, I saw them, oh, they are ferocious. <laughs> yeah, they're so cute. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm saying we are not strong as animals, we are not uh, as resilient as they are in nature, but we are invested with a certain intelligence. But unfortunately, it is this intelligence that human beings are suffering because they don't know how to handle it. So, if I ask you, do you want your intellect to be sharp or blunt, what would be your answer? Sharp. Sharp, of course. So, if I give you a sharp instrument, it's very important you have a very steady hand, otherwise you'll cut yourself or cut somebody up. This is all that's happening. This is all that's happening. If you had half the brain that you have right now, you would be very peaceful <laughs> No possibilities, but peaceful. So right now, humanity is just complaining about all the wonderful gifts that nature has invested in them, simply because we are not investing enough time to even see how this works. See, do you agree with me that you as a human being, you... this instrument of being human, this uh, human mechanism, is the most complex and sophisticated te technology on the planet. Do you agree with me? Absolutely. Have you read the user's manual? No. Uh, sometimes I think I have, sometimes I don't think <laughs> I have. <laughs> that means you didn't read it, all the fine print you did not read. <laughs> I will ask them to send you the link of Inner Engineering, you must do it. <laughs> please, please. <laughs> so, this is what Inner Engineering is about. It is about understanding what is the nature of your body, what is the nature of your mind, what is the nature of how emotions happen within you, how does your energy and chemistry function. This is not intellectually understanding, experientially gathering how to handle them. If you could make your body happen just the way you want, would you keep it healthy or unhealthy? Healthy. Of course. If you could make your mind happen the way you want, would you keep it blissed out or miserable? Blissed out, for sure. Blissed out. If you could keep your emotions the way you want, would you keep it in a higher state of love and compassion or hate and anger and uh, whatever else? Love and compassion. Yes. If you could make your energies the way you want, would you keep it at the highest level of invigoration and exuberance or keep it depressed? Highest level. Yes. See, your choices are obvious, this is the choice of every human being. But they are not able to make that choice simply because they think life is elsewhere. They think life is in a book, they think life is in a study, they think life is in an accumulation of information. No, you are the life. Hello? Yeah. You are life. Instead of paying attention to the mechanism of this life, how it happens and taking charge of it, we are trying to conquer the world. Very we even want to get Mars these days <laughs> <laughs> Sadhguru, What's the most mystical experience that you have ever had? <laughs> right now, what I'm having is a really mystical experience. You are there down under in Australia and I'm here in southern India and I'm seeing you and talking to you. If this is not mystical, what is? Uh? I know. 
<laughs> so when we say mysticism, we must understand, this is not like uh, I know all these uh, very flaky things are called mystical in the world. You must see, uh, I don't know, maybe in your bathtub if you see a rainbow, that's called <laughs> mysticism <laughs> or in the sky you saw somebody floating there, that's called mysticism. No, these are all childish imaginations, I must tell you this. Some uh, 123 or 124 books uh, we have published till now, most of the books except a few that I sat down and wrote, other things are all what I have spoken, they just compiled and they publish it. So I don't get to read through those compilations, it's just the transcripts of my talks, so it's okay. For people who know me, when they read, they feel like they're listening to me, so it works that way. So, uh, books come to me only for the title. So, one book came to me and I flipped around. Then I said, of mystics and mistakes. So, our publishing uh, department uh, wrote back and said, Sadhguru, this is too much up in the face. You can't see this. I said, well, that is the whole thing. Life is just this. There are mystics and mistakes. So, people who have made mistakes of their perception, they're the majority. Somebody who sees life just the way it is, you label him as a mystic. So mysticism means you saw life beyond the discriminatory process of your senses. When I say the beyond the discriminatory process of your senses, see right now your eyes recognize what is darkness, what is light, all right? Suppose you go and sit with an owl, and start an argument, which is darkness, which is light, tell me where does it go? Endless argument. You will think you are right, he thinks you, he is right, it's endless. Essentially, it is just that life is a complex amalgamation of many things. See, the intellect is such, it dissects everything and says, this is this, this is that. There is a man, there is a woman. Now you are sitting there as a woman. But you came into this world because a man and woman came together. Just because you are a woman, does it mean to say your father has made no contributions for you? Does he live within you or not? Absolutely. So, are you a man or a woman? Well, for social purposes, you are a woman. Yeah. Gender-wise, you are a woman, but you're a combination of two, isn't it? Absolutely. So, so the nature of the intellect is to dissect everything. By dissection, you will know the physicality of what it is. You will not know the nature of life. So, mysticism means just this, that you looked at life beyond the discriminatory nature of your senses and your intellect. Your intellect functions only from the information that your senses has accumulated through the sense process. What you see, hear, taste, smell and touch, it is from this your intellect has evolved. So, it has got all wrong information. If you depend on this wrong information, you are a mystic. If you do not depend on this wrong information and see life for what it is, you are a mystic. I love that. <laughs> Sadhguru, what is your favorite prayer? I'm sorry, what is? What is your favorite prayer? Prayer? Oh, I never prayed in my life till now. I never had the need. Even like words that you say or is there anything that you... Any, any, any passage or anything that you like, like a chant or yes, like a chant yes. or something. Yes. Oh, you want me to say it now? If you have a favorite one, uh, that would be. It's a question I always ask everyone. Oh, I don't have a favorite one. I can, <laughs> I can say something. Yeah, something that something that you like that you <clears throat> think would be nice to share with people. I don't do anything that I don't like, so I'm… Okay. Okay. <laughs> Is something favorite? No, I will always do things as it's needed for the situations in which I am. <clears throat> so, uh, this chant, I'll just tell you some meaning of it to some extent, not word meaning, just the context. This chant is talking about how time does not know the nature of your birth, Time does not know the nature of your death, but time is life. If you do not master the time, you do not know life. So the entire yoga, what it means is to have mastery over time. 
because time is the fundamental factor. See, in modern science we are talking about time and space. But space is possible only because there is time. This is point A, this is point B. If this space has to happen, there has to be time. If there was no time, this would be one, isn't it? Yeah. So, one who masters time, one who is on top of the time process, not time as a cyclical movement of the planet, not time as a cyclical movement of the clock, not time in terms of birth and death, but if you know time as the basis and platform of creation, then everything is fine with you, everything. Nothing about your life is ever an issue, either for yourself or anybody, but people can do what they want. At least there are absolutely no problem about what you call as myself, ever. You are never the issue in your life. There are other issues to deal with, you are not the issue. This much everybody must do in their life, that you are not the problem, isn't it? There are many problems, but I am not the problem in my life <laughs> But for most human beings, they themselves are the problem. If they're alone by themselves, they'll mess themselves up so badly because they are the problem. So, just listen to this. Kala na janati tava jananam Kala na janati tava samapanam Trushto maya tava mahakara yogeshwara kala kala yogeshwara kala kala Ah, I have chills. That is so beautiful. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sadhguru. I have a final question. What is a life of greatness to you? If any human being just knows how to experience life without messing it with the silliness of their mind, they will always live a life of greatness. They may be known in the world, not known in the world. That depends on what state of knowing or ignorance the world is in, whether they will recognize it or not. But essentially, if you're not messing yourself up with the silly little content that you have in your mind, you will always experience life as great because the greatest phenomena that's happening here is life. If you live here as a phenomena of life, it will always be great. It is a life of greatness, but the pettiness of your mind, if it dominates the greatness of life, then of course. Thank you, you're welcome. Come to Southern India sometime, you'll enjoy it here. Sadhguru, thank you for everything that you do. It has been an absolute honour to talk to you today and thank you for making this your first Australian podcast that you have been <laughs> on. It's you. been an absolute blessing. Thank, thank you for everything. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you.